Julia Evans is a software developer at Stripe, and in her spare time, she runs a blog at jvns.ca. Um, and she really cares about technology, and we're very, very pleased that she's here. Hello. Um, is my mic working properly? Yes. Yes? Great. Awesome. Um, so, I'm so excited to be here. Um, we're going to talk about being a wizard. Um, okay, so the key issue with being a wizard um, is that computers are not magic. And so you cannot actually, like, I cannot be like, here's a magic wand, right? That's nonsense. So, what does it mean to be a wizard? Um, I was thinking about this this morning, and I was like, well, um, in Ursula Le Guin's A Wizard of Earthsea, a wizard is someone who understands the world really well, and they use the understanding of that world to change the world, right? They're like, I will learn the true name of tree, and then I will <laughs> make trees, like, grow or whatever. Um, anyway, um, but, but this is what you can do with computers, actually, right? Um, because I think the amazing thing about computers um, is that there's something that, like, humans built. So if there's anything you want to know about how a computer works at all, you can figure it out, and you can understand it, right? And you can understand anything that you want, which I think is really cool, because it's not true of fields like biology, right, where you're like, how does the human body work? And they're like, we have a large number of open research problems. Um, but we know how computers work, um, because we built them. So that's very exciting. Um, but like learning, of course, how computers work is a lifelong process, um, because while you can understand any aspect of how they work, they're still very complicated. Um, and so this talk is kind of about how to move from like a fixed mindset of like, oh, I just like don't understand this stuff or I'm not good at it to like, no, I can understand anything I want. I just need to spend time on it and like, I'll figure it out. But like, how do you spend time on learning stuff, right? How do you spend time on understanding how everything works and becoming a wizard who knows everything? Um, and so I'm gonna talk about a few different strategies for understanding everything. Uh, no big deal. Um, so um, the first thing we're gonna talk about is abstractions and like what it means to understand an abstraction. Um, because I, I think that like, uh, okay, so like these, we, we have a lot of different abstractions that we work with as programmers. Um, you have like things like Wi-Fi, there are like dictionaries and da data structures, there are programming languages, there's CSS. Um, and th there's a lot of them, right? And I think um, one really common problem that newer programmers have um, is that they'll, kind of get lost in rabbit holes and they'll be like, oh no, there are all these ideas and all these concepts and I can't possibly understand all of them. Um, but what you have to do is you need to kind of like separate the interface to an abstraction from like the fun, like the underlying how it works and be like, okay, for some of these things, I'm just gonna understand like the interface and I'll be like, okay, I'll understand how this, like how to use the data structure, but I'm not gonna worry about how it works yet, right? And to kind of like just be like, okay, here are the things where I only understand the interface to it, and then here are the things where I understand how it works, and just like make good choices about like which things you're gonna learn at which times. Um, so, um, I wanted to talk, like make like what I mean by like interfaces and abstractions kind of clear. Um, so with dictionaries, uh, you have your interface to the dictionary, right, which is like you just like, you get an element from it, um, you can set elements, and it's really fast, right? Um, and what's underneath dictionaries and is that there are hash functions, right? And there's a lot you could learn about hash functions. You could spend like months learning about hash functions in SHA-1 and SHA-2 and like Shatter and like the safety of hash functions and cryptographic hash functions. But you don't need to know any of that to use a dictionary, right? Um, which I think is really cool. Um, another one of my favorite interfaces is TCP. Um, TCP is really exciting uh, because like the way packets work, right? Um, when you send a packet to someone, is like you send a packet across the internet and anything could happen to it along the way, right? It could arrive like slowly, it could go accidentally through Hong Kong, um, and it might not arrive at all, it could get lost in like your local wireless network. <laughs> um, like anything could happen to your packet, um, but the way TCP works and the way it appears to work is you just open a socket, you send a bunch of bytes to someone, right? Like you send them a video and it just arrives in the right order, which is magical. Um, and so I think it's really cool that you don't need to worry about like how packets work, right? Um, but of course you can't, right? You can be like, okay, um, for a while I'm just gonna like not think about this interface and be like, oh, I'll just send stuff and it'll arrive. And then, but you can also be like, oh, here are packets and the internet protocol and routing and BGP and like how does wireless work? Uh, and I think that's really fun. Um, okay, uh, so you don't always have to understand your interfaces, right? Like I don't understand how Wi-Fi works. Um, I was just at my mom's place and I was, she was like, the Wi-Fi is slow, can you do anything? And I was like, uh, I actually don't know. I'm confused, and I spent some time like googling like decibels and 
trying to figure map the house and figure out where the anyway. Sorry, this is a digression. <laughs> But like, so, so like, what is it worth understanding, right? Like, when should you try to understand how something works? Um, and I, I think this is a really important question uh, because if you try to understand everything all the time, um, you'll never get anything done. Um, so uh, a really uh, key point when it's interesting, important to understand is when you're trying to debug a hard problem, um, for example, where the Wi-Fi wasn't working, right? I was like, oh, maybe I should learn something about how Wi-Fi works in order to, um, in order to debug this, for example, uh, I learned that apparently if you set one of your Wi-Fi antennas to be uh, like vertical and the other one to be horizontal, like the direction of the router's Wi-Fi an antenna is somehow related to like the direction of the receiver's Wi-Fi antenna. So if you have antennas going in both directions, maybe it can be good. Um, but don't quote me on that. I don't understand. Um, but I was like, oh, cool. I understand like one more thing about how Wi-Fi works and it can maybe help me debug this Wi-Fi problem I'm having. Um, it didn't, I just, but <laughs> the Wi-Fi is still slow. <laughs> um, but, but, but understanding thing, how things work does in practice normally help me do like hard, hard problems um, when I actually understand those things. <laughs> um, it can help you push the limits, right, or optimize performance. Like if you're trying to really do something new, um, then you need to understand how things work, right? If you're going to build like weird new networking technology, you need to actually understand how networking works. And yeah, so, uh, right. Um, so I said that you can either understand your interfaces, right? That's important. Um, some interfaces that I think are like useful to understand are like things like HTTP. Like I think knowing how the HTTP interface is really good, works is really good because when you're making web requests, you're using HTTP. Um, I think understanding a little bit of the interface around processes is really good. Like how do you start a process? How do you interact with processes? Um, even if you don't really know how they work. Um, I think Git is a really useful interface to understand. <laughs> Uh, because we're using that all the time. Um, but I don't really want to talk about that because I feel like that's pretty well covered. Like we know how to read documentation more or less. We know how to, how to learn interfaces. We know how to, re how to use them. Um, but uh, what, do you, what, what do you do if you want to understand what's, like, what's underneath an interface, right? Like what if you want to learn how Git works? How do you figure it out? Um, so I, one way I like to do this is to kind of like take the thing Especially, and like push its boundaries in some way. Like be like, can I do this with it? Can I do that? What happens if I have 100 of them, right? Um, what happens if I try to use it really fast? What if I try to use it in a weird way? Um, and I like to do experiments with things that I'm trying to understand to, to try to figure them out. And I find that that really helps me. Um, well, for, for example, for like Python threads, uh, an example I came up with was like, well, what if you have 100 Python threads and you want to know how many CPUs it uses, right? Because that kind of tells you something about Python threads. Um, and the answer is one, because uh, Python has like the global interpreter lock and it never lets you use more than one CPU. And then you're like, oh cool, I understand like what lives underneath the threads interface a little more now, right? Because um, I know that it'll only ever use one CPU. So that's interesting. Because that's not true of like threads in other languages, right? Where they will use more than one CPU. Um, uh, another one of my favorite things to do to understand how things work is to build one myself. Um, so if you understand how hash tables work, want to know how hash tables work, you can just build your own hash table. Um, and that's kind of easy to do in a way, like, I think, because when you're trying to build something yourself to understand it, you don't need to really build a good one, right? Like I built a HTTP stack a while ago, uh, like four years ago, um, and I built it in Python, and it wasn't like a production TCP stack that could actually work. Um, I built it in like a week, um, but I learned a ton about TCP, and I like managed to send network requests to google.com. Like I used my TCP stack to talk to google.com and I sent a request and it gave me a response and it was like not happy with me really. Like, it, like at the end of my connection it was like, uh, what are you doing? Like, <laughs> like I could tell that I'd done things that were wrong but it did give me a response and I was like, oh cool. I can make like one of these, right? A little bit. Um, I can make like a baby version of one of these. Um, and I think you can learn so much by like building a baby version um, of like one of the things you're trying to understand. Um, and of course it's not important that it really works. Um, oh yeah, I have these rules for programming experiments, which are like it doesn't need to be good, right? And it maybe only needs to like kind of work. Um, and the point of, I think, doing experiments like this is just to learn, right? And I think it's really important to separate programming projects where you're trying to learn something from programming projects which you're trying to release. Um, and a lot of, in a lot of my learning pro projects, I'll just write like really terrible code, right? <laughs> and they won't work well and they won't perform well. And I'm like, that's not the point, right? Like it's, and uh, I'll still put them on GitHub. <laughs> uh, but like, yeah, I, th I think it's good to separate those two things um, and to not beat yourself up about like your code not being like good if you're just using it to learn. 
Um, another thing I like to do sometimes is read things that are too hard for me. Um, one of my favorite blogs is Jetson.io, which does like analyses of databases and just distributed, distributed systems and like tries to figure out uh, like, like is this database linearizable? Um, and the thing I love about this blog is that when I started reading it, there were a lot of words that I didn't know. Like it was like, let's see if this is linearizable. And I was like, linearize a what? Like what does that mean? <laughs> um, and I think it's really fun to read things that kind of are too hard for me. Another good example of this from today, actually, like from this week, is there are these new security vulnerabilities like Spectre and Meltdown. And when I read about those, I'm like, oh wow, there are a lot of words I don't know <laughs> in this, right? Like they're talking about like branch predictions, which I like kind of know what it is, but like very vaguely. Um, and I, I, th I think it can be really cool to take something which is happening in the world and you're like, what is this? And try to, try to like dig into it. Um, and I think like it can take a really long time to like understand these things. Like someone was like, someone who's like actually like a security expert was like, I read the Spectre paper and I read it like seven times and I still only like understood some of it. Um, but I, th I think this is a really good thing to do. Uh, and the most important thing strategy to me to try to figure out how my systems work, um, kind of on the inside, is like every time I don't understand something, not every time, but like frequently when I don't understand something or like when something surprising happens, I'll be like, that's weird. And then you kind of have like two choices when you're like, that's weird, right? You're like, well, either I could be like, well, I don't care, it's fine, I'll leave it. Or you could be like, no, today I'm figuring it out. And like today I'm gonna figure out how Wi-Fi works and I'm gonna fix it. Um, and uh, yesterday was not the day when I figured out how Wi-Fi worked, but maybe a future day will be, right? Um, but like this week was the week where I figured out a lot more about how MMAP works, right? Um, and so I think, I think it's like good to decide which, like today is the day that I'm gonna learn this thing and do it. Cause that's the only way that you become, that, that you get there. Okay, um, so in our quest to understand everything about computers, uh, a very important resource is other people. <laughs> um, because there are always tons of people around me who know lots of things that I don't know, right? Um, and I know lots of great people. And so how do you ask them questions, right? Like how do you like extract the information from their brains into your brain so that you know it too? Um, I think that asking questions is like kind of an interesting skill. Um, so I wanna talk about it. Um, well, I guess, I, I think I hear people a lot say that they're worried about asking questions because people are worried that they'll find out that you don't know everything. Um, what I've always heard from like my managers and people I work with um, is they're like, all I want is for people to ask questions when they're confused, otherwise you'll just get stuck. And I don't want you to be stuck, I want you to like fix your problems, right, and move forward. Um, and so I think no one has ever told me that I ask too many questions and I ask a lot of questions. <laughs> uh, so like, what's a good question, right? Um, I think a good question is easy for the person to answer, right, and it gets you the information you need, that's it. Um, so how do you build questions like that though? And I, I, I think this is not obvious, right, because uh, there are a lot of questions, like you can be like, well, how does Docker work, right? And I think that's not really that good of a question because it's not that easy to answer because there's a lot of like, like there's a lot of parts to how Docker works and it might not get, get you the information you need, right? Because like someone might attempt to answer it and you're like, oh, that wasn't really what I wanted to know. Actually, I want to know about something else, right? Um, and so I'm mostly gonna talk about how to ask more specific questions. Um, normally when I'm in interrogating someone about something like how does Docker work, I'll, 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 I'll try to um, get a lot more specific and I'll give you some examples of that. Um, so, one of my first favorite things to do when asking questions is to state what I know. Um, so, for example, for Docker, like what do I know about Docker? I could be like, well, maybe I'm really interested in how the Docker file system stuff works. And I'd be like, okay, so I know that with Docker you have uh, just like, virtual, like you, ha you, ha you have the, these, these file system drivers in the kernel, these, these like layered file system drivers, um, and there are a few different ones, um, but like I don't know how to figure out like which file system driver my operating system is using right now. Um, and then suddenly I've gotten a lot more specific, right? Because like the file system stuff about how, about how Docker works is like, uh, okay, I'm pretty far on a tangent. <laughs> But anyway, the, the point is that like stating what I know like helps me organize my thoughts and it might reveal like misunderstanding th th that I have, right? Like maybe something I said there about how Docker works isn't quite right. Um, and it also like really helps avoid answers that are too basic or too advanced, right? Um, because 
uh, if I have like said all this stuff about Docker, people, people can be like, oh, I see. I can see like exactly where you are in your Docker understanding. Um, and I can give you the information that you need to help you get to where you want to go. So the next thing that I think can, can be really helpful, I think um, when I'm asking my coworkers questions, I often don't really do research. I'll just like ask them. Um, I think if you're working, like trying to ask someone who you really don't know well, like maybe on the internet, I think it can be more important to do research because people have less time and they don't know you, so they're like less invested in like helping you. Um, and so I think, yeah, doing research can be great. Um, but I think it's more important when you don't know the person well. Uh, okay, uh, so we talked about being more specific. Uh, and. I think like kind of like the bigger the system you're trying to ask it, you're trying to ask about, and like the more specific you have to be, um, which, I, which I feel like is kind of counterintuitive, right? Because when you're like, when, when you think about a really big system like networking, I think often people try to get like an overview, or they're just like, okay, can you explain to me like the big picture, um, which, which I think can be good. Um, but what I usually end up doing instead is just like finding like the smallest piece of it and asking like the most specific question and then building out from there. Um, so an example of this um, is I really like to ask yes or no questions, right? Because they're super easy to answer. Um, and like, like trying to think of a yes or no question which will help me get closer to the, to the information that I want. Um, so for example, like does this database do hash joins, right? Um, and the answer to that is like either like yes or no. Um, and I think like building yes or no questions like this really forces you to like think about what the information that you want is um, in, in a really clear way. Um, another like variant on the yes or no question um, is often like if I'm asking a question which I think is a little vague, um, I'll try to like guess the answer to that question. So I'll be like is the reason we don't use threads because of the global interpreter lock, right? And I think that's really good because then people can tell like the kind of answer you're hoping for to the question. Um, so often like the answer I might guess is wrong because I, I wouldn't be asking um, if I knew the answer. Um, but, and, and it, th this also makes it super easy to answer, right? Because people can tell, they're like, oh, I see the kind of thing you're looking for and then they can correct you and be like, no, actually the reason is like, no, 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 no. Uh, and another one of my favorite questions um, is how do you do that, right? Um, I think. Like so sometimes my colleagues will do really cool things where they'll like fix something, and I'm like, wait, how did you fix? How do you how did you fix it? Can I watch you? And I think like finding like the point right after somebody did something that you're interested in, and asking them how they did it is a really like powerful point, right? Because like if you ask them a week, week later, they'll be like, I don't know, I don't remember. But if you ask them right right now, then they can't like, then then they will remember, right? Because um, people often know things that they don't know that they know those things. Um, so, like, figuring out tactics for, like, extracting information about the things that people don't realize that they know, I think is really important. Um, the last thing that I've been trying to do as I become, like, more experienced as a programmer um, is to always ask my questions in public and to be like, I don't understand how this works. Can you explain the specific aspect to me? Um, and I think like asking in public, especially like for more experienced people, um, is really important because it helps show that everyone doesn't understand things, right? And we're all constantly like interrogating each other about like how does that work? How did you how did you implement that? Like what does this library do? Um, and I think just like having a constant conversation in public um, where people are talking about like what they don't understand is really important. Um, okay, um, so one thing that happens to me more and more as I learn more things is that more often the people around me don't always have answers to the questions that I have, right? I'll be like, how does this software work? And they're like, I don't know. You know more about it than everyone else in this room. And I'm like, oh no. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> That's kind of an achievement, but what do I do, right? I can't just be like, how does it work? <laughs> um, okay, so th this is good. Um, and one great skill here um, is you can read the code, right? Because the code has many answers. Um, sometimes they're confusing answers. Um, sometimes you need to read. Sometimes you're dealing with a code base, which is four million lines of code. Um, and you're like, oh dear, <laughs> how will I find it? <laughs> My eyes can only read so many lines. <laughs> um, uh, but we can figure it out, right? Um, 
even if it's not documented, you can still read the code and you can still figure something out. Um, and I think the way you read a huge code base is kind of the way you ask people questions about a large system, is you try to like ask the code base really specific questions, right? Um, like I think with something which is smaller than maybe like 2,000, 3,000 lines, you can just like kind of look at it and read the functions and see how it's put together and be like, okay, I get it. I write all the code, I see how it works, that's fine. Um, but if you're doing something which is 100,000 lines or a million lines, you can't just like start at the beginning and go, right? I think you really need to just like, like start somewhere specific and like build out from there. Um, this, uh, so I, I'm kind of stealing some of this from a really good talk Josh Matthews over there gave at QSEC about how to read code, um, which if it's recorded, you should also watch if you're excited about this. Um, okay, so uh, one really specific thing you can do is just like understand a mystery error message, right? Sometimes I'll have like some weird distributed systems thing and it's like, it will print an error message and I'll be like, what does that mean? And I'll look in the documentation and no one will have mentioned it anywhere, right? And then it might not be written in a very helpful way. It might just be like, well, it's broken. And you're like, oh, okay, what could it be? Um, and then you can just read the code, right? And be like, well, okay, I see what it means. Um, that's not that complicated. I can figure it out. Uh, another thing you can do um, is search for like strings from the UI. Uh, that you see, uh, a, an example of this from the other day is I was trying to learn how GDB worked. Um, and I kind of like went and I looked at the GDB GitHub repository. Um, GDB is a debugger um, and it has a lot of lines of code and it's kind of arcane. And I was like, oh, oh. And I just sort of looked at it in GitHub and I clicked on a few folders and I just speared it away and I was like, oh no. Um, <laughs> I don't know where to start. Um, but uh, if I had remembered this trick, um, I could have done it because I saw this weird error message actually, um, slash string, and I didn't really, well I didn't really know what it meant, but I also didn't really care what it meant. Um, but so someone else pointed me to the file that had like the functionality that I was interested in understanding, because I was interested in like one, one very specific thing that GDB did. Um, but I was like, I don't know where to find the code for that. Um, but what I found out was that like the weird error message that I saw um, was a string that was in that file, right? So if I just like grabbed for that like weird string, um, then I could have found the exact file that I wanted, which uh, I think is really cool. Cause like it can like, this can let you like, I think like really quickly find like exactly the thing that you're looking for. Um, an another thing that I like to do is like kind of, like instead of like looking for just a specific string, kind of look for like an idea I have about the code. Um, so there's this Python async library called async.io, um, which, ha which, and because it's an async library, it has a thing called an embed loop. Right, and I was like, okay, I don't know anything about this library, but I know it has an event loop, and therefore there must be a loop, right? <laughs> so if there's a loop, where is it? Um, I know what a loop is, it, even if I don't know anything about this library, and I found it. Look, um, it says while true, <laughs> do the thing. <laughs> if you're stopping, then stop. <laughs> and there it is. Um, that's on line 419 of lib slash async.io slash base events stop to one. Um, and I think I, I felt really happy when I found this, because I was like, oh, I have like, I know the soul of this library, right? Because the event loop is like one of the most important things. Um, and there it is. It's like indented like three times, but we found it. It's, it's hiding in there. And I feel, then I felt like I could kind of like go out of there um, and look at kind of the things around it and then figure out how it worked. Um, and that made me really happy. Um, I think another fun thing you can do, especially if you're trying to read um, some, some like internal code that your colleagues are working on, is sort of like explore, like refactor it, where you're like, I don't understand how this is organized, so I'll just organize it a different way, right? Um, and then like organizing it a different way like forces you to understand it. Um, and uh, I, th I think I see people do this a lot when, when they join a team, they might be like, oh, I'm refactoring this, and often I'm like, well, that's probably not better, right? You probably just put it in a way that you understand it, uh, but like, you're probably not actually improving it, I think, if you're just doing like an initial refactoring. Um, so I think it can be really good to do exploratory refactoring, where you're like, okay, I'm gonna refactor this, I'm gonna move everything around, and then I'll just put it back, right? <laughs> and then it's like, you've improved your own understanding, you haven't made like unnecessary changes, and like everyone wins. And then maybe later on, you can decide like actually something needs to be refactored. Uh, 
and the, the other good thing about this is, is I think refactoring is very dangerous. Uh, <laughs> and you can introduce a lot of bugs. <laughs> so if you do git reset dash dash hard, <laughs> then you're saved all of the bugs. <laughs> Which I think is really great. Uh, free debugging shit. Don't change the code. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Um, so putting in print statements, I think, can be super fun. Um, this is also like exploratory print statements. Um, one of my favorite like at evening uh, understanding projects was one, one evening I was like, I want to understand how SQL databases work a little bit. And then I was like, okay, how can I do that? Um, so I picked up a SQLite, which is this like little tiny SQL database. And I was like, okay, um, what happens when I run a select query, right? Um, what code runs? And so I found a function that ran somehow. And then I put a print statement into it. Um, and then I ran some select statements. And I was like, how many times does this function run? What are the arguments? Um, and this was really cool because I could kind of like, just like see if the function got called as many times as I thought it would. Um, and it made me feel kind of like a little more ownership over the database because I was like, oh, I ran the select statement and my code ran, right? Like I put code in there. Um, and I, it really helped me understand like what happens when you run a select statement exactly. Um, and it was really cool. Um, okay, okay, how are we doing? We're doing great. Um, my last user skill I want to talk about is debugging. Uh, debugging is maybe my favorite thing because there's this really cool feeling when you're like, something extremely weird is happening on my computer um, and you have no idea and like no one around me has any idea and then I'm like, no, I'm gonna figure this out. And then I do, and then I fix the bug, and I'm like, wow, I know how things work, right? Um, I can figure them out, I can fix them. This is like, and I think it's like, this is like a really kind of like wizardly feeling um, when you find like a truly weird computer behavior and you fix it. Uh, so, uh, I think one of the most important things in debugging um, has been to learn to like really love my bugs and to be like, no, these are good things. Um, these will help me. So like, why are bugs a good thing? Um, why are bugs important? So, I think one of the most important reasons bugs are important is that they help you learn where you believe things that aren't true. Um, for example, I used to believe that on a computer you could open as many files as you wanted, right? You could open files, you could open more files, you could open files forever. Um, this is not true. Um, it, and if you open enough files, at some point you will get an error which says too many open files, right? So this is a cool bug, right? Because it tells you about, about it told me about something that I didn't realize could happen. Um, I also once ran out of inodes, um, which were something I didn't know that I could run out of. And I was like, cool, great. I understand computers better, right? Um, so in that way, gifts are kind of, bugs are kind of a gift, right? It's like the, the universe is giving you a gift to, to like improve your understanding. Um, another reason debugging I think is important is that it makes you better at writing reliable code. Um, because I kind of think of there as being like three kinds of bugs. So there's, there are bugs that you run into every day, right? They're like kind of typos. Um, maybe you like didn't handle an exception correctly. Um, and these are really important to like program defensively against, right? So that's the kind of bug that happens every day. Um, you should probably like be careful to make it not happen. Um, and then I think kind of like the more interesting class of bugs is the kind of bug that happens like every month. Um, and I think one thing that especially newer programmers run into is that they won't like realize that that could even happen, right? And like, and I think the more of these bugs you see, which happen like sort of inf infrequently, but still frequently enough to matter, um, then you can be like, okay, I see. These are like the sort of infrequent events that happen that I should still care about, right? And I should still take into account in my code. Um, and then the last class of bugs, I think, is things that almost like quote unquote never happen even though on computers sort of everything happens. So, um, like things like a compiler bug, um, or like on a server, I think like, like, like depending on how many servers you have, um, maybe things like memory errors are not that frequent, like corrupt memory is, that, is maybe not that frequent. Um, so it, I think that kind of depends. Uh, anyway, um, but, but I think having like the right classification here, here is something that you can really only get by running into a lot of bugs, right? Because like when you start out programming from like first principles, you're like, well, anything could happen. Right? I can't, uh, do I need to just defend against everything? And the answer is like, no. You just like run into a lot of bugs. And then you learn what's common and what isn't. And then you program the right way. Um, 
but like, how do you how do you get better at debugging, right? Like, how do you get better at actually fixing bugs um, instead of just being like, oh, that could happen, um, and figuring out what the bug is? So I think a useful thing um, that really helps me is to remember the bug is happening for a logical reason. Uh, this uh, seems really obvious, but I still have to remind myself of it, of it every single time because I think every time I run into something really weird, I'm like, oh, that that can't happen, and then I'm like, well, but it is. Right, and then I'll do it again. I'm like, oh, it happened again. Okay, and then I'll do it again. I'm like, oh, this is this is really happening, right? Like, <laughs> this is real life. <laughs> um, okay, now that we've really established that uh, this is happening, what do we do about it, right? Um, I think especially with really challenging bugs, it's been important for me to kind of like build confidence that I can actually I can actually fix them, because um, it feels really scary to be to like some bugs take me a really long time. Um, like they might take me days or very rarely weeks to fix. Um, once I spent a lot of time trying to optimize like a Hadoop job, like a MapReduce data processing job that was super slow, um, and it took me three weeks to figure it out and fix it. And that felt kind of scary because like I feel like one or two weeks in, I was like, what if I don't fix it? That would be embarrassing, right? Like, uh, but of course I did fix it um, because. Uh, I, like you kind of just have to think about things. I think, like, 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 like if you have like the right knowledge, um, then you can just fix stuff using like logic, <laughs> for the most part. Um, and I think being confident that you'll get there is really important. Um, something I learned while op while debugging this performance bug um, is, so I had this job and it was processing a thousand records per second, and I had this like long conversation um, with a friend that like is a thousand records per second a lot or not a lot. Um, and it wasn't really obvious to me. Um, and one thing that I discovered while trying to while trying to fix that bug is that a thousand records per second isn't a lot because um, that means that you're doing like one thing per millisecond. Um, and the things that I was trying to do weren't really that complicated. And a millisecond in computer land is really a very long time if you're just like doing some calculations, right? Um, and the, the 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 reason it was um, this was happening was uh, actually that floating point exponentiation is extremely slow. Um, but I think it was really useful in this case to kind of like train my intuitions about like what's slow and what's not slow. Um, because when, when, when I brought up this thing, I was like, here's a thousand records per second. People around me also weren't sure, right? They were like, is that slow? I don't know. Um, so I made a game out of this uh, called Computers Are Fast uh, by me and Kamal. And you can play it. And it'll give you a bunch of programs, and it'll be like, how long does this take? And you have to guess, and you'll get them wrong. And it's really fun. <laughs> um, I know because everyone else has also gotten them wrong, including me. Um, I think I met like one person who was like, oh, I got almost all of them right. And I was like, who are you? <laughs> um, but I think al almost everyone gets most of them wrong. Uh, maybe, how much time do we have? Maybe we could play it later. We'll see. Um, Another really important thing has been to have a good debugging toolkit um, because I think that like like I'll have a lot of questions when I'm debugging, right? Like so f for example, in this uh, when I was trying to debug this slow program, I was like, well, which function is the program spending its time in, right? And um, the thing I tried to do originally when I tried to debug that was kind of like guess. Like I was like, oh, I think maybe it could be this. And then the next thing I did was I went to like the person who knew the most. And I was like, hey, where do you think this program is spending its time? And he was like, oh, maybe here, right? Which was a really good guess, but it was wrong, right? Um, because I think you can't just like guess what is happening, um, even if you ask like the smartest person or the person who knows the most. Um, you actually need to use tools to figure out the real answers to those questions, right? Um, because people are almost always wrong, uh, is what I've, not all, people are usually wrong, I think, though. Uh, I'm usually wrong about the things that I think uh, about how, how programs work, uh, especially when it comes to like specific weird bugs that I don't understand. Um, because specific weird bugs that I don't understand usually like, like the reason I don't understand them is because there's something missing in my mental model of like how the program is working. Um, and so it's like very hard to guess what's happening because if I knew what was happening, I would like already know what the bug was. Anyway, um, so. What, what happened in this case was we used a profiler, right? And then we, it told us which 
crunch it was slow, and then we looked at it for a while, and then we were like, oh, floating point exponentiation. Um, and then I was like, wow, floating point exponentiation is really slow. Um, and doing bit shifts is a lot faster. This is like incredible. Um, and then we made the program like 15 times faster by changing like two lines of code. <laughs> and they were not the two lines of code we thought they would be at all. <laughs> so it was really cool. Um, I wrote a uh, zine about debugging tools for Linux because I got so excited about being like, you need to have the right tools to ask the questions that you need to ask. Uh, like, and it's on my website at jivins.ca slash zine. Um, but I think like the most important thing about debugging is that, like, like I said before, that I learned to, learned to kind of like, like it, right? Like when there's something weird happening, I'm like, well, we're probably gonna learn something from this. <laughs> and that's, that's, that's something that's really important to me. Um, and I like learning new things. So it's just like a fun learning opportunity. Um, and I think I, I usually learn more from bugs than I do from like, just like programming when things are working, right? Because when things are working, then I'm probably just like applying stuff I already knew. So the bugs are better. Um, okay, okay. So these are all the wizard skills we came up with. Um, we understood our abstractions. We asked questions, and then we read the code when no one could answer our questions, and we fixed extremely hard bugs. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is taking on really hard projects um, and like things that sort of seem scary. Uh, this is something I'm trying to do right now um, more. So like often when I see something that's kind of hard, I think that like someone else should do it. I'm like, oh, well maybe somebody who knows everything about that should do that project. Um, but the, the issue with this person who knows how to do everything um, and is magical is that they usually don't exist um, or they don't exist like at your company, um, and that the real person who actually exists is probably you, right? <laughs> and like existing is a key advantage <coughs> when working. <laughs> so um, the the way I kind of like think about it now is like uh, I just like am me. I have like a bag of like abstractions that I know and that I know how they work. Um, I have like, I can go read the code and figure out how things work. Um, I have like a collection of like bug friends that I've seen before over here. <laughs> um, and I have maybe a plan for like how I'm gonna approach it. And I can like figure it out, right? And frequently I can and I'm like, oh cool. That's awesome. I didn't know any of this stuff before, uh, but now I can figure it out. Right now I'm trying to figure out how to write a profiler. And there are many things I don't know, um, but I'm like, well, I'm doing this project, and I'm me, and I'll just figure out how to do it, and that's fine. Um, some ideas that I have for you um, is maybe ask questions uh, about things you don't know about, that you wanna know about. Um, maybe read something that's really hard or confusing, like this weird like specter meltdown stuff, or, some, or something that you're actually interested in, if you're not interested in that. Um, maybe like take like a weird abstraction that you use every day and figure out how it works on the inside. Um, I've done that a lot and it's made a big difference to me. Um, maybe read the code. Maybe do a project that's really hard. Um, those are the ideas. That's all. Thank you.